storm show. Hey, it's a storm show. All right, storm chasers, welcome back to the show. Today, I have the privilege of interviewing comedian, sketch artist, the original creator of Toby Jones. Um, you remember his face, even if you think you don't. We're gonna pull up some stuff in this video where you're gonna be like, "Damn, I remember that." <laughs> um, this man is an all-around entertainer performer and i have the pleasure of speaking with him today robert hines welcome to the show well first of all thank you brother storm for having me on your platform is amazing i also want to give a huge shout out to essie berry that lady yes. has given me so much of her time and so much love and i don't think people understand how hard this struggle is for her because they are coming at her at every angle they're trying to take away the woman's freedom over somebody getting side booty or having drama in their life like that's crazy if I'm trying to help somebody who you are screwing over and you decide I am now your enemy, that's a that's a rough place to be in, especially the, when the person you fighting is a celebrity. Man, let me tell you, it's it, it's like fighting a machine. And shout out to Essie Berry. She, she made this connection. She's she low key been like my program manager. I, <laughs> I, be, I, I be telling her, like, damn, Essie, do I owe you some money? Like, don't hit me with no invoice 10 years from now, Essie. Let me start making payments on it now, whatever I owe you. <laughs> you know, that's that black girl magic shit, man. I mean, yeah. honestly, the only thing that's holding America together is black people. And the only thing that's holding black people together is black women. That's period. a fact. That's a fact. That's a fact. I, I've learned that too. And being in this business, we see. People that look look like us start off with somebody that look like Essie and then end up like Jonathan May just running down the yeah, street. From yeah, running from some drunk ass white woman. <laughs> <laughs> running back to a sister saying, I'm sorry. I fucked up. I'm going My back. Bad. Going <laughs> you know, the interesting thing about his name is the same name of the dude that played the six million dollar man in the 70s. And to see him running from that white woman, all, all I can hear is the $6 million man music. I'm a man of a certain age. And back in the 70s, they had this dude. Uh, no, his name was Lee Majors. And he played Steve Austin, astronaut. And every time I see this dude running from that white girl, I be like, doom, 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 doom. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. I, I had to pull it up. Hold on, hold on. Because you know what? I know what you're Six talking million about. $6 million man. He was bionic. The bionic man that they made. Oh my! Yes, God. yes, yes. <laughs> it's some with the name. Apparently, it's some you with dig, the name. You did. <laughs> well, well, listen, Mr. Hines. You know you are the original creator of this uh, Toby Jones character, and you essentially had your creation stolen from you. That's the that's the best way that I can describe it. Um, I can say that everything that Mr. Hines is going to tell me today, he sent me receipts, uh, trademark uh, paperwork, copyright paperwork. I went to the actual original YouTube channel, and um, this man is this man is being written out of his own history, so to speak. So I'm going to show some clips on the side so people know what I'm referencing real quick, and you should be able to see it here. So if you go to the Big Dog Eat Child YouTube channel, you'll see that about 14, 15 years ago, they had a Toby Jones character on there, right? Good ass barbecue foot massage. Jones big ass truck rental. Was it's funny as shit, even when you say it. Uh, Jones cheap ass prepaid legal and daycare. Y'all see the views that it did. You see the impact, of course, that it had. And this was back when YouTube was first starting and a lot of people didn't understand what youtube was and what it was gonna be um Absolutely. Absolutely. so i guess i want to start off with saying like how did you get hooked up with those guys originally uh back in about 2008 i met them at a coffee bar in a coffee uh joint in naperville illinois and i was doing stand up there and it was a variety of of, com of comedic arts there the group was called big dog eat child they were a sketch comedy group and they needed help with one character that they couldn't make work, right? And so when they came to me, the thing that they gave me was a name. They said, okay, the character's name is Toby Jones. We cannot make it funny no matter how hard we try. Can you help? And I said, sure, I could. Because for me, it's always about the young comic. And Bernie Mac helped me a lot, so I try to help young comics a lot, right? And so I, I went on ahead and I did it for them. And 
when they put it up uh, in this is I keep in mind this is back in 2007 or eight when okay. they put it up within six months the first one was called Jones Big Ass Truck Rental and Storage Facility and um, when they put it up it had it, in a in a in a month it had a half a million down here Jones Big Ass Truck Rental and Storage. I, I wanted to actually show them the date that they put it up. They put it up November 12th, 2008. And that summer we shot it. And what happened was they, after it, after it did um, well, they signed me to a contract. They signed, I signed a contract where I would get 20% of whatever they made off of it. Because again, they, they introduced me to the situation and I'm being fair. We produced it together. But in their minds, I'm guessing they're seeing that they are just, I am just the actor and nothing else. And most of the dialogue I came up with on the spot and everything that they did, they did dirty. Like they didn't. So first of all, when they first signed me to the thing, I wasn't, again, I didn't know what YouTube was, didn't know a whole lot about it. And I didn't even know what going viral meant. I just knew that it had a phone attached to it and they asked me to answer it. And I would answer the phone regularly and it started to be too much. Right, because mm. each one of the videos have a phone number attached to them. That's part of what made it go viral is that they could call me. And then what happened is that after the first video, they decided let's make a second video. They didn't even come up with the name for the second video. Someone else did. So it was eight of them in the group. It was seven of them in the group originally. When the thing went viral and they moved, uh, the the Castro brothers, Romero and Pedro, moved to Los Angeles in 2012. Well, when they moved, they got rid of the whole group, and now it was just Castro Brothers Productions, right? Nobody else was involved, just them. They took it from everybody. They didn't even mention nobody else on their site other than me until I made mention that they didn't do it, right? So the second video, one of the other people in the group came up with the idea. Let's call it Jones Big Ass Truck Rental. They said, let's call it Jones Truck Rental. and No, they call it Jones Barbecue and Foot Massage, which was the second video. And I said... You got to leave that big ass in there. You got to leave that ass in there because that's part of the trademark. And the other yeah. thing I told him, I was like, uh, the very first video, all of the all of the points that make up the video, I came up with on the spot because a lot of the shit that they wanted me to do was terrible, right? And again, I attributed their terribleness to their youth because they were much younger than me. And so what they did was when they, when they had me sign the contract for the first two years of the videos, they paid me. Not on time, but they paid me what I thought was what they made. I didn't know that when you involve with YouTube, if you get more than 100,000 followers, they give you a silver plaque. Didn't yes. even know nothing about the plaque. Didn't know nothing about the money they was making every month. They were telling me that they were giving me 20% of what they were making. And initially, the biggest amount was from T-shirt sales. It wasn't from ads, right? And because I wouldn't pack T-shirts in a bag, they wanted, to wanted me to take less of a percentage. Now, now, there's a lot of things that are that I'm telling you at the same time, but I want them to be sort of chronological so you can understand. Right after the first video, when they started selling the first group of T-shirts, they wanted me to come to their house with T-shirts with my face on them and put them in a bag because they didn't feel like I was working hard enough for them. Now, check this out. And, and, and every step of the way, they fucked up commercial opportunities. They stole commercials from me. There was a boat show. There was a boat store that in the store, in the store, commercial is on their website on their youtube page it was it was a a, a a dream dream boats or some some such they wanted me to do a commercial for their boat for their boat store they said buy a boat there it is right there they they was like no we don't want him to do the commercial we don't want to wear the character out now i could have done the commercial as myself but they told those people that i shouldn't do the commercial because they wanted to keep the money right oh and, Absolutely. And I knew nothing about it. The only way I found out is I was doing comedy on the South side and some white dude walked up to me, man, we wanted you to do our boat commercial. And those guys told us that the character, they didn't want the character saturated as if I couldn't do it as me. Now, 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 now speaking of that, we, now I, I want the, I want the viewers to see this. That video has been on 14 years and it has 80,000 views versus when they worked with you, you getting them millions of views. Absolutely. Absolutely. And all this time, me being humble, me trying to stay in my place, me trying to be like, hey, you know what? I'm not going to mess with you guys. And after the first two years, they pay me okay. Then about 2010, they stopped paying me altogether. 
didn't get a dime from them, not a nickel, right? And from 20, from 2012 to 2019, I didn't get anything. And because they started to want, Hannibal Burr started to help me out a little bit. And when they heard Hannibal's name, they wanted to get back involved. Not only did that happen at the same, right before Hannibal got involved, um, Laugh Out Loud's YouTube page put me up on that YouTube page. And after, after I got on Kevin Hart's Laugh Out Loud page, all of a sudden NBA players started hearing about it. And Steph Curry started dancing before every playoff game in 2015. We had a TV pilot. A bunch of things happened. And the numbers started to go up on – on because at first, Big Ass Truck Rental was the highest – had the highest amount of views. Okay. When – Steph Curry and them got involved. Uh, um, barbecue and foot massage because it had that jingle skyrocketed. It went from about eight to nine million views because the first one was truck running, which was about nine, ten million. All of a sudden, it got leapfrog because barbecue and foot massage started. It got me on Good Morning America. It got me all. I mean, all over the country, people knew about it, but I wasn't making a dime. You understand? Every time they got views, they never paid me, and it was supposed to pay quarterly per the contract. Okay. They didn't pay. So then, about 2019, they was like, uh, "I asked them for a partnership. That is all I asked them for." Storm. I was like, "Listen, we need to make this a different type of deal. We need a 100% partnership, 50 50. You know, like a 50 50 partnership or something, because I'm not seeing any dollars at all, and you're making all the money." And it was like, "Well, we feel like you did this." In the in a spirit of wanting to make more videos because they didn't have any new content, they weren't right. putting up new. They had took a bunch of videos of me that were old and remixed them and repurposed them and put them back out, and they started getting 70, 80,000 views every time they put them out. So as soon as I asked them for that partnership, shit went south. I copy wrote just that song, Jones Barbecue song, seven seconds of the beginning of one video. Didn't ask them for shit else. Just seven seconds of one fucking video, right? And they, and as soon as I copyrighted the video, because I had already negotiated, you said you didn't want to be my partner. You made it clear you just wanted me to work for you for free. So I took the song and I copywrote the song. When I copywrote the song, their lawyer, um, Chris D. Giamante, told, advised them to go back and copyright everything else, including the song, right? They copyright everything else, including the song. And then started coming at me about copyright infringement. Oh, they took man. down my first YouTube page. This YouTube page is a YouTube page I had for a while and wasn't using. And then they took down my first YouTube page, which had about 2,500 followers, which not a lot, but I wasn't on it a lot. Again, I'm just starting yeah. to realize about 2015, 2019 area, this is something I need to pay more attention to. Now, everybody around me knew what was going on but me, right? And, and keep in mind, I'm a little older dude, and this stuff is evolving faster than I'm paying attention. Right, so when I asked them for the partnership, they went in and copyright everything. Then they start sending me copyright actions from the copyright board. They asked me for one hundred fifty thousand seven hundred and eleven dollars. The the seven hundred eleven dollars now, when they didn't pay me all those years, they telling me they didn't make but eighteen hundred dollars. This is the actual number that they gave me from twenty fifteen to twenty nineteen. Now they didn't even ask about ten or eleven or twelve or none of that. From 2018 to 2019, they told me my portion of what they made was 18, a little bit over $1,800. In all of those years when that thing had skyrocketed so far, never gave me a fair accounting, none of that, right? So when all of that was over, when all of that happened, they sued me. They tried to get at, come at me because you can go to federal court, which is very expensive, or you can go to copyright board. The copyright board, every copyright violation is worth $150,000. So they're saying I violated their copyright of Jones Barbecue and that because I had YouTube take it down for 10 days, 10 days, they estimate they missed $711 in 10 days. Now, you bitches ain't paid me for 12 years. You're going to ask me for almost half of what you paid me from 2015 to 2019 in the $711 total. And, and and you think that you're going to get away with this? Now, here's the thing. When you go to copyright court, when you go to copyright court, if you if you go straight just to the copyright board, you can just opt out and say, I don't want to be involved in this. So 
So I did opt out because I'm not finna give them 711 nothing, especially when you ain't paid me all these years. Right. In turn, what they also did, they got a trademark. The lowest level of, of protection you get is copyright. The highest level you get is trademark. These bitches are selling t-shirts and, and mugs and shit with my likeness on it. And they're trying to get a trademark for me. They have, I, I don't know, I may not have sent it to you, but they got a spread shirt situation and everything on the page is me or a rendering of me. And they want to trademark my image. The character. They feel yeah. like they have the right to do that because of that contract that they didn't pay on. So that is the biggest issue. That's why I had to go fund me because when I talk to lawyers, it's going to cost anywhere from five to 25 grand, maybe even 30 to do it. Well, they don't want to go to court. As soon as I sign a lawyer, I know they're going to give up because they don't have the rights to me anymore. Just like you repossess a car, I can repossess my image because you ain't been paying. Yeah, they have not been upholding their end of the contract. And, and it's, and it's shiesty. Now, I did want to, because I, 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 I looked up the name. Is this the person right here? Hold up. Pedro and Romero Castro. Yes, that's the, that's the, that's the most shiesty of the two. The Romero Castro is the most shiesty. Pedro is more of an artist. And what he learned and what he knew that Romero didn't is that when we were getting these taping sessions, sometimes they'll ask me to do shit so stupid. I'd be like, I tell you what, just turn the camera on. And that's how almost everything that's in all of those videos came about is because like it's one part in the first video, uh, Jones big ass truck rental, where it's a raggedy ass car with T-tops because we did it in a big ass lot. It's a raggedy ass car with T tops and it's rain and snow done been all in this car and it's all rusted over. They like get in the car. I was like, oh no, I'm not getting in the car. Just turn the camera on. And and key moments in that video, they didn't have anything to do with. I just like they weren't even gonna use the bus. They started walking. I'm like, this a bus. Y'all not finna you turn the camera on. And they turn the camera on, and then I just start talking. And that's how most of it was was done. Is that most of it was ad libbed? I I don't know if I sent it to you. I can send you the original script from barbecue and foot massage none of the stuff that was in that video was any of the dialogue that they wrote and and this is what people got to understand when it comes to you know these iconic characters um just like you know marvel they own their characters and they're able to make money off of that this is a really big deal some people that really don't understand entertainment and intellectual property. Cause that's what we're talking about is intellectual property. That's it's true. not necessarily uh tangible, like, you know, like my t-shirt, but guess what? Purple rain. Somebody owns the name purple rain. Mm -hmm. uh, um, the, the image of Prince that's on my stomach. Somebody owns that. Um, the name Shaq. Somebody, th that's a brand Marilyn Monroe. That's a brand. Only certain people can, use that name you know or if you do you have to get written permission you have to pay whatever whatever give a percentage they okay. license it out that's basically what it is and so it's like i couldn't um and now i'm just putting it in terms that people can understand because we're not attorneys but um no. but no. we work in this business it's like i couldn't put out an underwear line and call it skims that's kim kardashian she owns that Absolutely. name she actually Absolutely. even behind her sister's back if y'all remember the sisters their first line was a perfume line called kkk the kardashian well they they, they flipped it but you get the <laughs> i know you know, exactly like, well. <laughs> you know, you KKK, they put it like kkw they were they were clever with it but they didn't know they had a whole episode on the show they they said kim you went and trademark you went and trademarked our name this is our daddy name you went and try and and kim on the whole fucking name <laughs> You can't trust family. Who can you trust? <laughs> but Kim felt like fucking. I'm the leader of this shit. I'm the face of this shit. So I'm, I'm trying. Yeah, Kim, like I put that magical penis in my mouth to get us. <laughs> the mama didn't even know. The mama said, "Wait, you did what?" So, so for the people that's watching, that's why when Black China tried to go change her name to Angela Kardashian, they stopped this shit. Like names brands trademarks copyrights it's a very very um um powerful thing what's another example right here's, here's like this, this right here mm -hmm. this is owned by a corporation i can't go sell that shit on t-shirts they'll send me a cease and desist ownership creates wealth yes period 
if you own something, and that's why they were so upset about me keeping the song. The song's at the beginning of the most popular video, and the way that the song came about was me. We were standing outside in front of the venue, and they couldn't get in, and they had a chicken and dinosaur costume that they wanted to use, and we started dancing a can-can in front of this restaurant on 119th and Western in the south suburbs of the south side of Chicago, far south side of Chicago. And they was like, sing something. That's why, That's how it happened. And I started singing, Jones Barbecue and Foot Massage. Jones Barbecue and Foot Massage. Better come down here and get some of this shit. Now, keep in mind, the song would have been longer, but everybody around me started laughing, including the cameraman. So we couldn't get any more than that. That's what it was. And all I was going to do at this point, and I will tell the world what my plans are, because somebody out there might be able to help me. My idea is that I plan on licensing the name to licensing the song to video games. Like if, if, if somebody knows how, how I can get connected with like, um, Fortnite or somebody like that, then that's exactly what my plan was. I'm like, okay, I'm gonna keep this song and I'm gonna do what I got to do with it. Well, they re copy wrote the song. So now I got to go back and sue them. Not only for that, but I got to keep an eye on their trademark application because their trademark is all me. Yeah. It's all it's all you. It's it's some thievery and it's been done in this business since the beginning of time. You know, I tell people when it comes and it's funny because when it comes to entertainment and sports, that's our shit. We dominate this shit. <laughs> it's a fact. Without us, they don't have that shit. I'm in the gossip sector. Without niggas, nobody's listening to this shit. We don't you give a fuck about that. We don't give a fuck about what Brad Pitt doing, but you know who is making money? Chris Sean and Blueface. <laughs> absolutely. 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 So, so I try to get people to understand that for for the especially for the new generation of black entertainers, we got to take advantage of ownership. And due to social media, we're able to do that. Before social media, you had to go through the machine, mm-hmm. the industry, the business, whatever you want to call it. But we still got to watch out for shisty ass people like mm-hmm. hold up pull this picture back like him <laughs> wait 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 who gets you to fucking oh come on man come on bro come on bro <laughs> and check this shit out not only not only do you got to watch them but you got to watch youtube too let's be honest that's because youtube is quick to take your platform from you uh True. based on shit that somebody told them right I showed YouTube my copyright. The only reason they took their shit down is because I had a copyright. So what they did was they showed their fake copyright and the contract, right? No, nothing. And so what YouTube told me is in order for me to get my shit back, all of it, I'd have to show that I went to court. That there had They said, we don't see any signs of litigation because it's not YouTube's job to litigate, right? It's their job to broadcast that shit. And if it gets too heavy for them, they're not gonna get involved. Same thing with spread shirt. If you look at the at their at the at the big dog site, they didn't put any sales of my image on their regular site. They only attached it to the videos that are Jones videos. Because I had started people looking at them, and they was like, "It ain't nothing up here, Rob. It ain't your face." It is. Look exactly at those videos, and there is a page plus. Of shit and, and four or five of those things they're trying to get trademarks for. Now, every time you get a fake trademark, that's 180 grand. 180 grand. That's the one that they put up on the regular page. Now, if you go to Jones, if you go to Barbecue and Foot Massage or any of those other ones that my likeness is on, it's gonna have a different store on it. That they own that name, Jones, Jones Barbecue and Foot Massage. Fine. I'm not fighting you over that. What I'm fighting you for is my image and my song. And that's all that I wanted from them. Now they're gonna have to put my name on every fucking copyright they have because from this point forward, when we go to court, absolutely. Look at all the products they have. You're gonna have, to, and this is the killer part. I know they made money with it because my niece had put up my my picture, and and the fact that I needed help on her um, Instagram page, two point two million people seen it in three days. Wow. Yeah, they've been they making money. buying shit from them. Yes, sir. I, and I ain't gonna hold you. I ain't even trying to be funny. You funded their uh their lifestyle in California. Absolutely, and their lawyer and all the rest of that mess. Yeah. So right yep. now I'm looking for a lawyer. I'm I'm trying to get this thing settled. And I know that it ain't gonna take that much money. It ain't gonna take as much money as a retainer because once a lawyer come in, 
they gonna have to be on the same time clock I'm gonna be on, and they not gonna want this to keep going. That's true. <clears throat> That's true. Well, let's 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 leave that there. All of the information, all of your social media links, GoFundMe, everything that you sent you sent me, we're gonna have it in the live chat. And so people will be able to click it as they're watching the videos. Now, I did have a secret I was going to talk about because you are so oh, kind to good. put me on there. And I okay. know this is kind of what you do. I think Let's we talk it. a little bit about it, but if but I will go, we can do the intro and I'll or do whatever intro into that you want me to talk about. The Bernie Mac shit, I'm going to start, I'm going to spill a little tea about Bernie. Yeah, yeah, let's let's let's, let's talk about Bernie because we seen Cat Williams. He he went over to Club Shay Shay. That name of that show still gets me. But what? <laughs> <I know. laughs> it's still you are too me. big and black to let yourself be called Shay Shay. This one, this one got me about Shannon Sharp. No shade to Shannon Sharp. You could probably yeah. kick my ass, but no, no shade to him. It was the way he was so scared. He, he, he. <laughs> the, the whole interview. Ah, oh my god! Then I look. I said, "Do this nigga got a sweatsuit on? Do we got a beige <laughs> sweatsuit on?" I said, "No, nah, Shannon, you can't." Uh-uh. So, so women, so, so, so tell us about the real. And, and keep in mind, I am a huge Shannon Sharp fan. I am a huge Shannon, but he, he did. That, dude, you done been taking on 300-pound motherfuckers, and you scared because Cat Williams is telling a degree of truth to Hollywood that most people already knew, kind of had a feeling. Like, it ain't new that Steve Harvey was a dick. Hell, Steve Harvey was a dick when I met him in 91, and he was balding in 91. You understand what I'm saying? He didn't have that much hair in 91. This is my Steve Harvey story that I told with Essie Berry. I was a young comic in 1991, 92, and the All Jokes Society was the first black comedy club. And I worked there from six weeks in until uh, it went to the new building, right? It was in two different places. The first place was called the Loftorium Muse. And there, we didn't even have alcohol yet. You see what I'm saying? They were oh, selling wow. clearly Canadian, and so and it was still being packed around the block. It was amazing being a part of that. It was part of my own personal um, renaissance being around those guys. And what happened was they they had booked Steve Harvey, and the first night on that I, I don't know if we were doing Thursdays yet because eventually it was just Friday and Saturday at first. Then we went from Friday and Saturday to Thursday to Sunday, and from Thursday and, and then and then I talked them into doing a a Wednesday open mic show. A lot of people don't know that. I, I was intric- integral in getting them to do that. And so this is what happened. We were working that Friday night, and it was my job to introduce the show, seat the place, and keep everybody's time, right? And and the first show at 8 or 8.30, he had went over drastically. Like, he just kept talking, kept talking. And Mary Lindsay was the manager at that time, and she told me, I don't care what you have to do, get Steve off that stage. So, you mm. know, we used to shine, shine the light in the back of the room. Now I'm shining the light directly at Harvey, directly at him. And he sees it, he started talking a little shit. Then finally he came off stage and he had this giant offensive lineman who was like his bodyguard. Big back to, back, back, to, back to, to tell you how, how I, I have some receipts, back then he was selling T-shirts about crack. Uh, America's cracking up and I don't get the joke. That was the t-shirt that he was selling. And that big old offensive lineman dude was holding all the t-shirts, right? So Steve comes off stage after the show is over. They trying to clean the room because it's a line down the block trying to get the next show in. He act like he didn't give a fuck, right? And so when he comes off stage, he walks up to me, 21-year-old from the south side of Chicago, me, and says, "Uh, you can't tell me shit about that stage now you might be able to tell me about basketball or some shit but you can't tell me shit about that stage and at this point i'm looking around like who is this nigga talking to right but i need this job this is my career so i say to him as humbly as i can say sir i know nothing about basketball and i just left it at that right after that i call my thug friends hey folks y'all come up here and we're gonna i want y'all to come hang out for the night I got your tickets. I got everything. Just come and and I I sat the room. So I sat them directly in the back of the room where they could be right in front of Steve Harvey. And this was back in the nineties. You know these niggas had pistols. They had Gucci. They had them uh Gucci sweaters on yep. and and gazelle glasses and shit. And you know these niggas got guns and they sitting in the back when the show was over. This was on the Saturday night engagement when the first show sat. And when the show was over. 
They stand up and they go, they used to call me Hollywood. They're like, hey, Hollywood, you want to tear this bitch up for you? I was like, please don't. Because <laughs> <laughs> I got to be here next week. And they was like, all right. And then they walked out just calmly. And when That's they how you know they real gangsters, because they calm with it. You want Absolutely. us to shoot the shit up? Uh, maybe tomorrow, <laughs> not today. <laughs> and as they left, this is true, and I can find someone else to tell you that it happened. The owner, whose name was Raymond Lambert, Raymond Lambert walked up to me after the show. I was like, damn, Rob, you know all type of people. I said, yes, Ray, I was born here. And I left it at that. Steve didn't say shit else to me the entire weekend. But I'll tell you what else he did. There was one of the most brilliant writers in black comedy was a fellow named James Anna. Look him up. He has a YouTube page. He passed away. His YouTube page is called Truth Paste. James Hanna Truth Paste. Hanna was so brilliant that a lot of his shit became stock because the shit he would say was so funny that people just had to steal it. It was just stolen from every, like everybody has stolen from James Hanna, whether you know it or not. Right. And that's him. That's him. That motherfucker was amazing. And James Hanna went up to Steve Harvey and was like, hey, Steve. Now, James was about five, seven, five, eight, you know, and, and Harvey's a little taller than him. And, and he said, uh, uh, Mr. Harvey, I, 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 I feel like I, I could write for you. I feel like I have I could give you, you know, jokes. And, and, and Harvey looked down at James and was like, if you think you got something that funny, you need to say that shit yourself. Right. Fast forward. Who's writing Steve Harvey's top 10? James Hanna. Who's writing a lot of Steve Harvey shit? James Hanna. The same mm. nigga that you disrespected is now out there in Hollywood jamming and writing for you. And he'll tell the world that he writes all this shit. He does not. He did not. James Hanna wrote a <laughs> lot of the shit that Steve Let Harvey Let me ask wrote. you, in, in your opinion, was Steve Harvey even funny? Like, how did he perform when he was on stage? He was funny. I'm not going to take nothing from the man. He was funny. He was patterning himself as much as he could around. Um, um, at the time, it looked like to me he was trying to be Richard Pryor. In the early 90s, he oh. was trying his best to do. Just like Bernie was patterning himself behind Robin Harris. Yes. Everything Bernie was Robin Harris. It was, if you look at Robin Harris, everything about the act, all the bad kids shit and all that, that was all Robin Harris. Now, here's my Bernie, my Bernie Mac story. When Bernie Mac popped, he didn't think he was going to. He didn't think he was going to ever be famous. He had no idea that he was going to be who he became. And what he did was when he started to make advancements to ensure, and this is business, to ensure that he stayed the guy, he eliminated a lot of people around him. He eliminated, he, he got all that shit. I'm bringing it home, Chicago. He wasn't bringing shit home. If you ask the, the, the comics from Chicago who were actually around during that time, most of them, even though they still loved him, even though they still fucked with him, they appreciate what he did. Most of them felt hurt by the way he abandoned Chicago. He wow. wasn't bringing no Chicago comics nowhere. Most of the Chicago comics that you see that actually fucked with him were people who already was already profitable, right? For instance, like um, the, the um, Chris Chris Rock used the guy uh, Ali Leroy. Ali Leroy won an Emmy. Or two, at least at least one through that Chris Rock show. That's who that and 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 Bernie and Ali knew each other because Ali started well before any of us. And Ali Leroy was the one who Bernie messed with from Chicago. Gotcha. But that's because nobody really nobody messed with Ali. <clears throat> Ali was like a comedy nerd, right? But he was brilliant, he was funny. I'm not taking anything from him. I'm just saying Ali never really hung out with the brothers a lot. He hung out. But when he hung out with him, you could tell it was a different Ali than when you seen him in white clubs. And I know that because I know what that feels like. I know what it feels like for white people to accept you more than your own people because you're a little too cerebral, right? I'm not saying that our people ain't 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 smart. What I'm saying is certain shit we attracted to. Let's be honest. How but, many people you think would prefer to see somebody talking about dick sucking or what have you, or to prefer you hear you talk about politics? I, I tell people all the time, you're not lying because I, even the way I deliver my content to my audience is in order for it to hit, yeah, you have to deliver it. This, this is how I tell people. Black people comedy tends to be very crass, abrasive, and I guess you can say aggressive. I guess you can say that. Use that word, but it's, it's very out there, right? When it comes to white comedy, you got to kind of think about it. Then it hits you like, oh, shit. It's, it's, 
it's different. I'm not saying one is better than the other, but you're absolutely oh. right. You got to be way more animated with our people. Our people have to feel you. They can't yeah. just be in it. See, because like, think about it like this. If you got a 400 year head start, which white people seem to have in this country, it's a lot easier for you to be entertained because you ain't as, under as much stress, right? Yeah. But, but, when, but when you got the pain of a 400 year head start and you got the spent fuel rods from being the country's nuclear power plant, because everything they got, they got from us. You remember, you could, we couldn't even get patents at one point. So most Fact. of the shit that was patented during the um, age of, of metals and shit, we didn't have nothing to do with it, but we came up with. We were doing the work. Who needed to be, who needed technical advances more than us, right? So, so when you talk to us, you got to talk to us in a way that we know we can trust giving you our attention. Yes. And that's just honestly what it is. But this is what I will say, though. Even though it's harder to get that black audience's attention and their trust, once you got it, you got it. It's over with. You could, it's over with. You, you are paid the rest of your life. They will support you forever. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's why the black people who do support me support the fuck out of me, right? <laughs> yes, same, same, same. <laughs> same. I'm like, I know as long as I got my community support, I, I can always make a living. Well, you right, know, right, because yeah. you know what? What we are is a part of the nerd class, sort of. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, I'm not, I mean, I, and I don't mean that as an insult. I mean, there's a group of us who are not being heard that you are giving a voice to who think a certain way. Now, now you know, it, the hood shit is going to always be featured first. We learned that through rap. We learned every bit of our culture that, that makes us seem a little less than, and, and I, I'm not trying to disrespect, but I will tell you this. You will hear from Flavor Flav before you hear from the poor righteous teacher. That's what I mean. Oh, yeah. Yeah. All the antics and the you boy. Yeah. <laughs> but but then it, then after a while, those gimmicks get old. Then you be like, because I'm not trying to be funny. The hood shit is cute when you're young. But when I see them and they're 45 and they 50 and I'm like, you ain't grew from that. You still gang banging. <laughs> you know, or the women like. Ain't the, let me say this. Ain't nothing sadder than an old hoe. Hoe in this old, <laughs> this young woman's back. You know what I'm saying? Like, you're supposed to be selling pussy in your 20s. You still selling pussy in your 50s? You just be like, you, you, like, you yeah. absolutely need to watch James Hannah's truth pace. He does a video about the all star game. He's like, all right, you hoes in your 30s, y'all got to make a way for the hoes in their 20s. <laughs> you need to move somewhere where don't nobody know you. Yeah. <laughs> And get it's married. So <laughs> get married and start the fuck over. You had your chance. <laughs> your whole time has passed. But you know what, though? Even though people don't want to hear that shit, that shit's absolutely a fact. And, absolutely. you know, I just, I, I love what comedy can do for the soul. You know what I mean? And a lot of, when we look at entertainment today, a lot of what we're missing is real comedy. Um, People are scared to get canceled. Absolutely. They're scared to lose platforms, scared to lose their jobs. Everybody's so sensitive. So let me ask you, was there any way, can, can we ever get back to like how raw com comedy was in the 90s and 2000s? And, or, or, I think or, people still making it raw now. Okay. I think, I, I mean, Corey Holcomb ain't, ain't yielding to nobody. Corey Holcomb don't give a good goddamn. Um, and see, here's the thing. Okay. So like in the in the early 90s, I was in style. I was that dude. I, I was one of the first people that Comic View chose to be on Comic View from Chicago. It was me, B. Cole, and a dude named um, uh, Alan Edge. And so what happened was I started working at the jail in 2004. And when I left comedy and, and, and started training to be a correctional officer, I got a special about me being a correctional. It's, it's called Lockdown. Um, Lockdown Detroit. I was I did it from Detroit. And and what oh, happened was when I came back to the clubs and like I left like 94. When I came back in like 95, 96, Corey was the dude. It was the difference between watching um, let's say Sir Mix a lot, which would have been me, and then watching NWA, which would have been Corey. <laughs> oh damn, you good at analogy too, because I know exactly what you're talking about. <laughs> Absolutely. And here's the thing about that that may, and, and I just want to give you some receipts. I know I'm jumping around a little bit, 
fine. But I don't want you to forget this. I want you to understand. Since I'm telling you this story, I want you to know exactly. I have receipts about Bernie, too. There is a man who actually was Bernie's partner. Him and Bernie was like this before Bernie made it. And his name is Evan Lionel. You can find Evan Lionel on um, on Quake's house. He does Quake's house on, on satellite radio. And Evan Lionel has been a friend to me since I started comedy. The only reason Bernie fucked with me is because Evan fucked with me. Oh. And, and Evan, when I, first, when I first went on stage at a place called The Funny Firm in Chicago, when Evan saw me, he grabbed me and was like, hey, man, you funny as fuck. And then he introduced me to Bernie and all the other comics. And Bernie told me, come down to my Monday night room if you want to. But Evan was the one who was who was who was pushing for me. And when Evan, when Bernie had once Bernie had made it, Evan went to talk to Bernie and Bernie didn't want to talk to him. Bernie did. Bernie gave him a phone number and, and Evan looked at the number. was like, hey, man, this is your assistant's phone number. Give me your number. And he gave him a second number. The second number was to the assistant's. The assistant's secretary. The assistant said, this dude took burnt, like, another quick story, just real quick. This is this is an example. And I have the receipts. There are people who know what happened. When Bernie did Def Jam, Adele Givens is probably one of the coldest females in all of stand-up. Oh, period. Adele and her yeah. husband have been together since the early 90s that I know of. You know what I mean? When I came in 91, Adele and her husband were together then. And her and Adele went to New York to do Def Jam. Or what Def Jam hadn't even started. Yeah, that's him. T-Tone. T-Tone is a straight hustler, cool brother, one of the coolest people you will ever meet, right? And they 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 clung together and made their business work. Well, Adele went to LA, went to New York before Def Jam started. This was before there was a Def Jam. And when she went to New York, she ran into Bob Sumner. Bob Sumner was the talent coordinator for Dev Jam. And when Adele went in there and exploded the audience, I mean, she tore the house down. They asked her, Dev Jam asked her, is there more funny niggas like this in Chicago? She said, absolutely. Go talk to Bernie Mac. Bernie Mac set up a showcase at a place we were working at back then called Spices. Right, right, Spices has long been closed. Spices was before all jokes aside. That's how old Spices was. And that was one of the places where I got to learn how to do stand up under Bernie and and under Evan. Well, Bernie did a showcase. Now everybody knows that Def Jam was seven minutes at best, right? Each set was seven minutes. Bernie did a showcase with five comics that he gave each twenty minutes a piece. Now it's a bunch of angry comics sitting around, and I didn't at the time I didn't expect anything from Bernie because I only had been doing comedy for months. And I'm like, why y'all niggas mad? What's wrong? Man, he put them niggas up. And one guy was from Detroit or something. Nobody knew who he was. He bombed terribly. Damn. And everybody's sitting there like, why would you give five guys 20 minutes when you could have gave a bunch of guys, like at least 10 guys, double that, maybe even 15, five minutes? He didn't want to be outshined. He did not want to compete with anyone. He did not want to compete. I want, uh, so I guess Bernie, I guess basically Bernie felt like I'm the nigga from Chicago. I, it, it, you know, it's, this is what people don't understand. Because comedians make us laugh, we think they all jolly. Man, comedians are some of the most sensitive, yeah. competitive. Every industry is competitive. Uh, the, Y- y'all, the, the 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 fucking porn stars have drama. Like they be compared, like <laughs> the strippers be now, nah, bitch. That's my client. Now, nah, bitch. That's my client. Like shit gets real. <laughs> Here's the thing, man. I, this, I'm gonna break this down to you for you to its essence. Two things about Bernie. Number one, Bernie was was 38 when people started actually looking at him. Now mm. you think about it. Most of these cats was man. You know, um, Martin and all those guys were in their early 20s. Right now, Bernie 38. Right. And the other thing is, this is this is across any industry. You tell me the industry and I will tell you this is the problem. The problem in America is capitalism. And that capitalism is based on white supremacy. Right. Yes. They built all this shit by getting free labor and free resources. So the less they can pay you and the more they can make you compete to get to them. The better it is for them. So if you understand this and you thinking, man. I'm 38. These other niggas is in their 20s. They cute. I got to get, you know what I mean? I got to get what I got to get. And then once he got it, 
He did not share it. He kept it and he kept excelling. And, 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 and let me tell you something. The dude is one of the coldest comics you will ever know. He, he was also pretty rough. Like he was a kind of mean, not, not to the point where you didn't want to be around him because you want what he had to give. But I, I'll give you an example. If you go to a comedy club right now, the very first person is going to do 15 minutes, maybe 10. The second person is going to be do, do between 20 and 30. And the last person is going to be doing anything from 45 minutes to an hour or so. They close it out. Yeah. Absolutely. Bernie would go on stage as the MC on a Monday night at midnight on Michigan when it was rough over there. Ain't nobody in that show but gangsters. Ain't nobody there to see him but people who shoot people. You know what I mean? <laughs> he would do 45 minutes in front of you of rip roaring hilarity and then introduce you. Now, how you how you gonna be successful? I'm not freaking that? following Bernie, man. <laughs> I swear to God, man, I was on the west side of Chicago, which is a rough part of town. Now, I lived in one of the worst parts of the city. But when you know everybody that'll kill you, it's different than when you go to somebody else's neighborhood. With and we was on at a place called um, somebody's chateau or some shit. It's a West Side ass room. And Bernie says, "All right, Rob, I'm gonna go do the show, and then I need you to go ahead and, ho- and, and finish it." And I was like, "Bernie, I can't follow you." And he said, "If you're gonna be a pussy, we can't hang out. <laughs> if I make him laugh, you'll make him laugh. God damn it, do the shit I told you." Which is which is which is mean on one hand, but then on the other hand, he like I believe in you, damn it, just get out there and fucking do it. That's the point. That is exactly the point. Like that was his way of saying it. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. You gonna have to sink or swim. This is real life. This is it. If you can, and that's why I don't really mind following. Even if I fail, I know I can. I can get something out of an audience, no matter who's on stage. You know what I mean? Yeah. Even the fact that it's not going well, I can make that work. I've been doing this shit for thirty-two years. So it's really very rare that I ain't going to get something unless I'm just not interested. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, outside of that, I'm going to get something. And that's what I mean. Those are the lessons that I said. I love the man. He taught me a lot. But nobody's perfect. And if you're dealing with capitalism, you got to expect there's going to be some cutthroat shit that's going to happen. It is. It's just, it's, it's, it's just what it is. And and, and it's, it, it's a beauty in there, too. It's like... It's like if you can survive Diddy, you can survive anything. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> if you can escape a Diddy party with your asshole intact, you can take one. <laughs> oh my God. I thought I told you that. I won't stop. I thought I t- <laughs> <laughs> But it's true. Like, I mean, honestly, you, you ain't never lied, man. You ain't never lied. And that's why this Cat Williams thing was amazing to me because I don't know Cat Williams. I ain't never met him. But I do know the shit that he was telling you was true. And he has also has the receipts. The Kings of Comedy came out what year? And what year was he on Comic View? Like, you could see that. You could see he ain't. And, and the other thing, when he went out and said that, look how many things have changed in the atmosphere of comedy. Look how much talking. Man, my well, People was moving. Hey, people, I mean... We had, you know, no, no, sh- no, no shame to Ricky Smiley. He crying over the coffee. We got, we got Ludacris. He done went in the studio. He done made a whole song. <laughs> Kevin stuttering on TNT. I'm like, this, this nigga got y'all shook. If it was me and he got me that bad, I'd have been like, you know what? I'm going to turn off social media for about two weeks. Come out with your hands up. Because <laughs> whatever I say, it's not going <clears> to. <throat> Think about it- this. Yeah, the dude sells out shit without anybody's help. Yeah, who gonna come at him? Who in Hollywood gonna do anything to him? You can't. But after learning his story, man, and how he grew up, and the brother been on his own since he was thirteen, and I'm like, just to think of like, man, you know, we know who he was at thirteen to be on your own is like you can't shake nobody like that. You and can't. You can't. He got my respect. He got my respect. He has all of, Let me tell you, man, I hadn't talked. Um, I, I wasn't married to this girl's mother, but I lived with this with this young lady and her mom. We lived together for years. And I, it was right before I got married to my wife. I was with another woman. And I called her daughter my stepdaughter. And she got in contact with me two days ago because she seen Cat Williams talk about Comic View. And she was like, my stepdad was on Comic View. And then she got in my inbox 
and was like, we probably need to reconcile. And you said some things that hurt me. And I was like, wow. And it, I'm just saying, Cat Williams put out energy in the universe that changed shit. Period. That's my point. And and, and and that's beautiful. You know, this is a season where, like, I feel like people have been spinning the block. Even people I haven't talked to hit me up like, how you doing? <laughs> you know, it's I'm like, damn, did niggas get humble? Like, what's going on in there? <laughs> You're looking around at the situation. I think that whole Trump administration made niggas have to cling together. You know what I mean? You're like, I wait, so. we got a false sense of security around here. <laughs> Now it was like, do I be an asshole and be like, nah, fuck you, bitch. Fuck you. What would you talk about? Or do I, you know, be a good Christian and, <laughs> oh, you know, but no, nah, you, that's, that, that's beautiful though. And sometimes we don't realize we say things to people and we don't even think about it twice, but it stays with them forever. Mm -hmm. mm, your behavior, especially amongst younger people. Cause she had, my stepdaughter didn't need me for shit other than a ride. You know what I mean? She was reading at three. <laughs> so, so by the time I came along, she was 11. Her and her mother would sit in a room and talk about Mesopotamian societies. Do you understand oh, wow. how smart these people were? And so for me, I just thought she was cool. She was like, no, I just felt like um, you should have given me more attention. You shouldn't have, you know, and I was like, you, you right. You are absolutely right. I just didn't know how to, you know, a little girl, and she had um, cousins, the little boys. I spent a lot of time with them because they little boys. You could knock them over. You could, you know. And I always loved kids, but this kid seemed almost smarter than me, and I was in my twenties, so I was intimidated. Like I'm not going to sit here and let this eleven year old tell me what to do. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what, though, I, I tell people: as long as that other person is alive, you can heal, and you can talk about it and get past. And a lot of times. All we need is that conversation. Absolutely. Absolutely. That will change things. You're right. You know, so for people that's watching this, call your mama, call your daddy, call your, we all got that estranged sibling somewhere. Just call, you know, and if you see they still in the same place and they still want to be ignorant, that's fine. That's at least you tried. Absolutely. Absolutely. We got to reconcile. This is the age of us healing. The, yeah. Everything, all the energy around us has given us enough positivity to realize, like, from, from the sister who wrote the 1619 Project to everybody, it's a whole lot of energy in the era that's telling you who you really are. Like, we always talk about who we really are, but we don't live in that love. Learn to love yourself because the adversaries around you are going to love themselves. They didn't True. give a shit. Remember all this shit about taking a knee with the flag in America? These motherfuckers smeared shit on the walls of the Capitol, and they still love those people. But you're going to get mad because somebody took the last biscuit or somebody said something about somebody you fucking? That doesn't matter at all. Let all it, that shit go. I had somebody explain that to me, and I had to even check myself. I said, we, are, we as black people, are so quick to throw each other away. Somebody mm -hmm. offends you one time, and you done. But the white man fuck you over every day. And you... <laughs> you keep paying them bills. You keep coming up with their money. You keep treating them with the respect yeah. they do. That's yeah. exactly right, brother. That is the best way to put it. We will throw each other away. Self-love. And that love has to start with our women. That love, we have to start. Um, that's why I'm saying, I, man, I am a huge fan of Essie Berry. That lady, she wrote legal briefs for me. She's done a whole lot of shit that people will never really know yep. and didn't ask me for a dime. They didn't ask me for shit other than just acknowledge that she helped. She's dope at what she does. And yes, sir. I remember I told her, I said, man, if, if you was you was about 20 years younger, I would marry <laughs> your way. If I had somebody like that by my side, oh my God. You could I'm run like, the world with a woman like that. I'm confident I could break I could go into Hollywood and I know she would make sure my black ass got paid. Like that's Absolutely. just mm -hmm. and that's even when you look, even when you look at these comedians, you see a lot of the times it's it's they women that held them down. And yep. uh like Kevin Hart. Yes. Yep. Hell, my like, wife is keeping me, keeping me in this game. My Renee Hines is 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 the city version of Essie Berry. This lady gets things done. And this other thing that we have to talk about. We I mean we got to just kind of remember is that think about what they had to go through. Like, think about their struggle. Like when you when you talking shit about why that girl look like that or act like a, what are the shit? How are we protecting them? How are we? What are we giving them to make them do the shit you want them to do? 
right? And, I, and I'm not saying you ain't got to force them to do shit because the thing about black women is when they behind you, they behind you. It's true. And we don't give them no, we, we just don't do enough for them. Well, brother, that's, that's, I'm, I'm, I'm going to leave it there because that's, we could talk about that for hours. Tell the people where they can find you, Mr. Hines. You can find me on social media, on all social media, Robert L. Hines on both uh, Instagram, Twitter, um, uh, 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 YouTube. I got a new YouTube page and I got new, well, it was an older YouTube page that I wasn't using, but since they, they, they took down my TikTok, bro, those guys took down, I had a TikTok, had 260,000 followers. They took that away. They took down my TikTok, my YouTube. The only thing they left me was Facebook and, and Instagram because they needed to know what I was going to do next. So they let, and plus, I, you know, I'm caught in that weird space of telling people what happened and knowing what to keep secret, right? And so um, that they've taken away all those social media. So we starting all over with YouTube. I gave you a link to everything we have, Robert L. Hines, on all social media. You can find me there from TikTok to YouTube to Facebook, to Instagram. All of it is Robert L. Hines. Appreciate you, man. You have a good one, all right? One other thing, brother, please. Let me just say one thing. There is a brand new black beer company in this region called Moore's Beer. These people are amazing, and they are giving me the opportunity to um, write commercials for them. And I will be when I will send you the, a, a copy of those commercials before we put them out. I will give you a copy of Appreciate that. I actually found their website. I looked them up with me. You was on the phone the other day. And um, listen, black folks, we love our beer. We love our liquor. We need more black owned companies. We yeah, so. we love our wine. We need black owned wines. We need all that. So I'm here for it. Thank you, brother. From, from the bottom of my heart and from more, we just want to thank you for giving us the opportunity to be on this wonderful platform. Y'all keep following, like, share. Click the ding button every time this man come on. We need to look at that uh, uh, brother beard and the skull cap shit. We need to see how every rip we get on YouTube. Come by the house, check him out. Please do that. I appreciate you. Let me let me ask you something before you go, real quick. Yes, I know so. I'm supposed to end the interview, but now I want to ask this real quick. So like, okay, so like I I deliver news, but you know I add the comedic element. So where could I go? Because people always be like, Storm, try stand-up. And I'm like, it's different. I try to tell people, talking about something versus being funny about everything is different. But where where do you go to literally, like, learn how to write a joke? I well, just say this shit off the top of my head. But, like, if you want me to, I can show you everything you need to know. Um, I can tell you, basically, right now, all the joke is is a setup and a punchline. Now, now, based on your style, there are really two different styles of stand-up. One is storytellers, which is Richard Pryor and such. And the other are one-liners. They're, you know, uh, take my wife, please. You know, one-liner type comics. What you would probably be in most black comics are, are storytellers. And, 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 and in a story, you need a bunch of little punchlines that lead to the main punchline. But okay. what I will do for you, as because if you have done so very much for me in the hour of time that you've given me, get in my inbox, get to know me. I, I mean, anytime you want to talk to me, you can call me. And I will do all that I can. What city are you in? You're in. You're in. You're in. In, in Illinois, correct? If you're in uh, Illinois, nah, I, I'm all over. But it ain't enough for me to fly to Chicago. It ain't nothing for that. I got a show at the Laugh Factory every month called House of Hines. Matter of fact, it's this Wednesday. Today, uh, it's, well, I don't know when we're airing this, but uh, January the 10th is my Wednesday night show this month. And I right. haven't gotten next month's show yet because I do have to build other shit around these shows. But I'm right. there. Once a month, in addition to that, you can um, find me on any social media. And you have a question about stand-up, get in my inbox. I'll be more than happy to help anyone. Appreciate that. Appreciate that. Because I, I definitely consider myself a commentator. But I'm like, it. you know how, like, you know, you kind of got some of the ingredients of a joke. But I'm like, if I can streamline that shit, I've had these people laughing for 45 minutes Absolutely. straight, an hour, all that. And that's what, that's what comedy crews tend to do. Like, when, as a comic, as a new comic, you come to me with your joke, and I'd be like, okay, well, if we change this and put this there, what are you trying to say? And here's where your punchline will be. Here's where your setup will be. Let's try this, this, and this. That's what we do as a community, as comics in the community. When we write together, that's what you tell me what your joke is, what you need help with. I'll tell you what I need help with. And together, we can perpetuate ourselves as a group forward. You can do way more as a group than you can do as an individual. That's a fact. Thank you for your time. I'm going to let you know when it uh 
when it when it comes out i probably can't make it on the 10th but i can definitely come for february okay that'll be wonderful man let me know and i'll definitely put you up or i'll do whatever you need to do to get to the point where you can be put up for sure take it easy you have a good one all right thank you sir appreciate your time have a good one peace right and we're gonna hit this outro and we out peace. Uh, it's storm show uh, it's storm show it's storm show.